Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, this week's uh, Center for Energy Studies webinar. We're um, happy to be uh, joined by a number of participants, and co-sponsoring this event today is the Western States and Tribal Nations Group. Um, uh, I just want to make a few introductory remarks before handing it off to Michelle Foss, who will be a Master of Ceremonies today. Uh, we've got a number of speakers. Uh, we're going to go through some really interesting work that I think will uh, make you all think um, uh, a little bit about uh, the role of U.S. natural gas in global LNG markets and um, how it can have actually regional implications, both domestically and abroad. Um, one of my colleagues, actually two of my colleagues, one of whom is on this call uh, on this webinar today, Anna Mikulska, along with Gabe Collins, have recently recently authored a piece which should be available online pretty soon here um, regarding Nord Stream Two and the role that the U.S. is taking with regards to that particular piece of infrastructure, which has been, suffice to say, controversial for a number of years. Um, uh, and one of the things they've pointed out is uh, uh, the U.S. actions really are aimed at uh, uh, something that is more geopolitical than economic, uh, in particular trying to garner or ring fence uh, uh, U.S. allies in regards to support for broader geopolitical goals vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, this actually has relevance for today's webinar, believe it or not, because a lot of the discussions that I've had with colleagues in countries like Korea and Japan over the last six or seven months have really been focused on the implications of, of, of more U.S. natural gas uh, uh, in the Pacific Basin. So waterborne supplies in the Pacific Basin actually do increase depth in market liquidity in the Pacific Basin, which have been viewed by our allies uh, in, in Asia as a very important marker for um, uh, their own decarbonization efforts, um, in particular moving away from coal uh, and doing so in, a, in an energy secure way. Uh, so that's actually an element of the discussion that is often not brought up when we think about energy transitions, but the role that US natural gas actually plays, not only economically, but geopolitically is quite important because many of our allies are actually relying on that source of supply to meet their own goals. So thinking about that in the context of today's webinar, in the context of what Anna and Gabe that I just mentioned have um, uh, recently written and should be available soon, uh, hopefully we'll put some, some uh, perspective on uh, what the future of natural gas in North America might actually look like. That's another issue that is a hot topic to say the least uh, in the broader energy transitions discussions. Um, so today, I, I know that we're going to hear a little bit about this. Um, uh, today's webinar is a little bit longer than we usually uh, uh, than we usually conduct, um, but it's because it's very rich in terms of content. Um, so with that, I am going to uh, uh, sit back and, and become an observer uh, and listen very intently with um, um, uh, with regard to what's going to be said, and has to hand it over to Michelle Foss, who uh, will moderate today's discussion. Michelle. You're muted, Michelle. Sorry about that. Thank you, Ken. Um, I'm very pleased to take over and and uh, chair this discussion today. Um, we've been actually working on getting this webinar together for a long while, and um, we're finally here. So I'm, I'm very pleased about that. Um, and I'm especially pleased to be able to um, put on the table um, a discussion a lot along the lines of what Ken mentioned, but adding some depth around the emissions benefits of US gas that I hope our, our panel will flesh out in a good way for everyone. But what I'm really pleased about is to be talking about Western US natural gas. Now this is a bit of departure for all of our um, usual audience who is focused on Texas and Texas production. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about uh, the discussion today because the Rockies are my old stomping ground um, spent a lot of quality time there in my life and career. Um, Western gas resources are rich. Um, they're important. Um, they do have challenges, and we're going to talk about some of those today. But they could be especially useful, strategic, um, provide numerous economic and environmental benefits if we have the courage to pursue them. And I think that's really the bottom line that we're going to be getting to today. Um, I am going to begin to share my screen and allow everybody to um, see again 
the uh, members of the panel who are joining us today. Um, in addition to myself as chair, Adabola Kasumu, who uh, will explain a bit about his background, has done some previous work on emissions benefits of liquefied natural gas. This time um, he will be presenting some work that's been done to look specifically at emissions benefits associated with the Western gas basins. A longtime colleague, Andrew Browning, who runs the Western States Tribal Nations Group, who will tell you all a little bit about that um, and what the group is doing. A new acquaintance, Wes Adams at the Utah um, CITLA, which is the equivalent for those of us in Texas of our general lands office. So he will talk about um, benefits of resource development and revenues for school lands in Utah. We'll have a bit of discussion after all of that because what we wanna do is tease out um, some of the details of the work that Adebola and his colleagues have been doing um, and that have implications for all of us here uh, at the Center for Energy Studies and the Baker Institute. And then after that, joining us will be another longtime pal, uh, Brian Lloyd, who I've known since his days at the Public Utilities Commission in Texas, who's now with Sempra LNG, um, and who will be talking about that particular set of assets. Um, so providing a view from a, a, a developer, supplier um, in the global LNG marketplace, and Anna Mikulska, my good colleague, um, who has joined me in all sorts of adventures over the past months, um, in addition to the paper that Anna and Gabe uh, are putting out that she's going to add some comments to later, um, she joined me in finishing up a natural gas book um, that uh, I think is going to be a good reference for people going forward um, that covers a lot of ground on all of the aspects of developing and using natural gas resources. So it's a pretty exciting discussion that we've lined up for you all today. Um, so without further ado, uh, what I want to do is introduce Adabola. And Adabola, I will move the slides as you um, ask me to. And uh, please just tell everyone in the audience a bit about yourself and then let us see the, the bottom line of the, of the work that you all have been doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Foss. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as introduced, my name is Adabola Kasumu. Um, I, I worked uh, together on this project uh, with um, Dr. Lauren Bergenheyer and uh, Dr. Kerry Kelly, uh, both from the University of Utah. And I'll be presenting on their behalf. Um, unfortunately, uh, both of them are not able to join us today. Uh, but if there are any questions um, um, that is directed towards their own part of the research, I'll be happy to um, get back to, uh, get it to them and then get back to the, to the questionnaire. Um, uh, as Michelle introduced, um, I've done um, some work um, since completing my PhD at the University of Calgary on um, the benefits of um, the, the net effect of um, exporting um, Western Canadian natural gas um, to um, Asian countries. And the first um, research that we did, um, which took into consideration the um, legal jurisdictions of, um, of um, natural gas, um, we looked at a total of about maybe 20, 21 countries um, and the second research, which was published in um, environmental science and technology, we actually narrowed it down to um, the most uh, viable um, countries, which are uh, five Asian countries, as we would see um, in the research. So without further ado, um, I would ask Michelle to please move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so you can just click to show everything on the slide. Um, there are three things here. So um, I'm just going to uh, briefly talk about uh, the premise for this um, research study um, that was conducted by myself and the two other uh, authors that I mentioned. Um, um, I'm going to mention some of the results, uh, the highlights uh, for the sake of time, um, just the highlights and uh, a few conclusions from, from the result. So the premise of this study is actually based, like I mentioned before, on the uh, 2018 peer reviewed study in environmental science and technology that looked at Western Canadian gas and what was the effect of um, the, net, the net effect of global um, GHG emissions if um, Western Canadian natural gas was exported as LNG 
to um, Asian countries, about five of them, uh, mainly China, India, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. And um, we looked at um, different scenarios of displacing, you know, a whole mix of electricity or just marginal electricity or, or you know, and, and we took into consideration in other factors like, you know, um, ocean distances and country factors like electricity transmission and distribution and, and power fleet efficiencies. And, you know, um, the, that's the premise for this study. And the same methodology that was used in that study um, is the methodology that we have used um, in this study. And it's, it's worthy to note that um, all we have used in this study um, are uh, publicly available uh, data sources and established emission factors to determine the life cycle emissions of um, LNG that is exported from Western, Canada, uh, Western United States to um, the Asia Pacific region and um, to displace specifically in this study, coal generated electricity. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, this is just a, a, a screenshot, a snapshot of um, the previous study um, that we did. And um, most importantly, it shows that by um, exporting um, uh, perhaps about 20, I think it was about 25 megaton per annum of, um, of um, LNG from Western Canada, the benefits will be um, using it to displace um, various scenarios of electricity in the, in the countries that I mentioned earlier. For example, displacing marginal electricity in China would result in a lowering of um, overall GHG emissions uh, to the tune of about 52.6 um, uh, megatons per year. And you know, these are all the results you know, for the different years. Um, uh, could you click, uh, Michelle? There's a statement at the bottom there. Okay, thank you. So overall, um, I think one of the most important conclusions from that study was that you know, there is a, a potential economic and environmental benefits um, that makes the justification for exporting natural gas from, from Canada from Canada to um, the Asia Pacific region compelling and as I mentioned um, to those um, five countries, um, which are the most likely destinations. And uh, this study was you know, um, done by uh, five of us um, you know, from four different universities um, you know, including University of Calgary, um, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Johns Hopkins University, and uh, Southern Methodist um, University. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so now before we talk about, you know, you know, what are the results that we got from this study, I think it's important to uh, put into perspective um, you know, do we even have, you know, the, the gas volumes um, from the um, U.S. Rocky Mountain basins um, to be able to justify um, whatever proposal, you know, this research study uh, might insinuate from the conclusions? And the answer is um, yes, and, and that is shown from the, um, as at the time of compilation of the study, um, the most recent gas volumes that we had um, access to was 2017, but I've just been informed that the figures for 2019 are out now. But based on the 2017 figures, we can see that, you know, the greater green, we focused on about 10 basins in the Rocky Mountains, and we can see that, you know, there's enough volume based on the estimates that have been um, published by uh, the United States Geological Service, that there is enough volume in in um, this Rocky Mountain basins that we focused on to actually um, supply um, LNG uh, to um, LNG to the, the facilities that have been proposed um, for at least if, if, we, um, if we take the 2017 volumes and make them remain um, constant for the next couple of years and make them available for um, local um, marketing, production and local marketing, there's still enough proven results to supply the proposed 22.8 megatons of LNG for at least 12 years. And this is based on 2017 figures. As, the, as Michelle mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, there is always more proven, the, the proven re gas reserve figures always increase as more survey is done. Next slide, please. And then one more click. Thank you. 
Um, so um, the the figures um, on this slide show um, the gas volumes, um, both the undiscovered gas um, reserves, um, the estimates and the proven reserves, as I mentioned before, as of 2017, and the production figures for each of the four uh, Rocky Mountain states of Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and Mexico. Um, the green uh, bar on the left is the 2017 production figures, and the red bar is the proven reserves, while the blue one is the um, undiscovered gas reserves. And on the right hand side, we have you know, how the production figures, uh, the production, the marketed gas production has been um, changing for the last you know, about 18 years uh, from um, 2000 to about 2017. And as I mentioned before, based on the 2017 uh, production and market figures, if we keep that constant, we still have um, enough um, gas to supply the LNG plants proposed for about 12 years. Next slide, please. Now, it's important to look at how electricity generation has changed in these five countries um, that we are focused on um, as potential import countries for um, Western Canadian um, liquefied natural gas. Um, if we look at the change in electricity generation between 2010 and 2018, um, we would see that the electricity generation for China, obviously due to demand, has almost doubled in those eight years from about 3,900 terawatts of electricity generated to about 7,200 terawatts of electricity generated. And although to a smaller extent, you know, there's been increases in other countries as well. Um, the only one that doesn't seem to have increased look, looks like um, um, Japan. And it's um, you know, important to put this into um, context as it, virtually everybody knows that you know, there is the ever um, increasing demand for um, energy, um, which doesn't seem to be slowing down um, anytime soon. So um, this is just to put um, the whole um, energy demand, um, you know, thing into context. Next slide, please. Now, based on that, um, we have broken down um, the the energy, uh, the electricity supply um, by um, electricity supply um, source, um, mainly coal and natural gas, um, for everybody to see on this four charts. Um, the first one on the on the top left hand corner is electricity generated from coal and how it has changed in those eight years that we mentioned. We saw how in the last slide, how the total electricity supply has increased um, from 2010 to 2018 in those five countries. Now, how, what, what does the breakdown looks, look like in terms of where does the electricity actually come from in terms of the electricity mix, um, considering coal and, and natural gas um, for this particular slide. Um, for the top left-hand corner, um, we see that as the electricity generated, the total electricity generated um, from in China um, has been increasing, so has the electricity generated from coal. And that has increased from about 3,000 to almost 5,000 terawatt hours. Um, however, um, the electricity generated from gas as well in, this, in the same year, um, duration at the top right hand corner, uh, you can see that while coal has increased, while electricity generated from coal has increased, that generated from natural gas in the top right hand corner has also increased. And the increase, um, the rate of increase for electricity generated from natural gas is way more than um, that of coal. So, can we say that, um, you know, natural gas is displacing? you know, coal-fired electricity. Yes, we can say that, but then um, to, to, to go down into the details, if we look at the two bottom charts, considering the share of electricity generated from coal and natural gas, on the bottom left-hand corner, you can see that even though the amount, the absolute amount of electricity generated from coal in China has increased in those eight years, the share of electricity generated from coal has actually decreased. If you look at the bottom left-hand corner, while the share of electricity generated from natural gas, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, has actually increased, even though this is still a very small percentage 
as you can see, um, coal still, you know, electricity generated from coal is still a very big percentage. It's still about almost, even though it has decreased from about almost 80% to less than 70% in those eight years for China, while the electricity generated from gas has increased from about maybe 2% to about 4%, it's still a very tiny amount of the electricity generation mix for these countries. And you can see, you know, for India, it's not very different. Electricity generated from coal is still about more than 70% in 2018, while that generated from gas is still less than, you know, 5% in, in, in 2018. In fact, the one in India has actually decreased for um, considering the natural gas um, share of the electricity. And you can tell similar stories for um, all the um, other countries as well. Um, Japan actually has the highest share of um, natural gas um, electricity um, um, generation, um, which is uh, almost about, uh, about 35% um, in 2018. So um, it's important that we show that um, natural gas still has ample opportunity, a lot of opportunity to actually displace coal-fired electricity in the countries that we have considered. Next slide, please. Now, this is um, the main um, highlights of the results from this study. And based on the methodology that was used in the um, earlier publication that we did in 2018, um, the same methodology has been used to assemble the aggregate life cycle emissions, um, greenhouse gas emissions of um, um, exporting um, specifically um, when Western, um, the Rocky Mountains natural gas as LNG to these five countries. So based on um, the methodology with details in the report that is about to be released, um, we found that the total life cycle um, GHG emissions uh, for um, LNG um, considering all the upstream emissions, the emissions resulting from, tra from transmission um, to the liquefaction facility, considering the liquefaction facility emissions, the shipping emissions, um, considering the, um, the ocean distances, the power generation in the import countries, and you know, the transmission and distribution um, emissions as well um, of electricity. Um, the total life cycle emissions is just over um, 600 um, gram um, CO2 equivalent per kilowatt um, um, hour electricity um, generated from um, the natural gas that would have been exported from Western United States, um, originating from the um, Rocky Mountain basins. While um, results from you know, the Department of Energy and, and, and NETL and other uh, published um, research studies have shown that um, the total life cycle um, emissions for, for coal-fired electricity um, in the import countries is in excess of a thousand um, gram CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour of electricity generated. And the top left-hand um, chart um, shows a comparison for the current study, um, which is um, um, colored in green, to a published um, life cycle emissions for coal from different studies. And as we can see, um, the lowest of them is the uh, 2019 um, DOE um, NETL um, study for the life cycle emissions of coal um, generated like electricity in China, and it's still above 1000. So it can be argued that there is a lot of benefits um, apart from the economic benefits that you know, can be gained from um, the export of um, um, Rocky Mountain um, natural gas as LNG to these countries, there is definitely environmental benefits that um, can be gained as well that can help um, these import potential import countries to achieve um, their um, their climate um, objectives. And on the right hand side, we have a comparison for uh, top right hand side. We have a comparison for um, uh, for for India. Uh, again, you know, you know the life cycle um, uh, GHG emissions um, resulting from the export of um, the Western U.S. Um, natural gas is way less than you know that 
resulting from you know coal-fired electricity generation on a total um, life cycle basis. And on the bottom right hand side is the comparison for uh, for Japan. And on the um, bottom um, right hand side is the comparison um, for South Korea. And the story is you know is virtually the same in um, all of these uh, um, countries. And next slide, please. So here is a table um, that actually um, puts numbers to uh, the charts that uh, we have just seen. Um, and um, it shows that the, the, the proposed 22.8 megaton per annum equivalent of United States um, um, West Coast LNG um, that we considered in this study, um, if all of that were to be um, exported as um, LNG to um, the five potential import countries that we have mentioned, um, that would be enough um, based on our calculation to generate and um, based on the um, average uh, power generation efficiency, uh, which is about 46.4 that we have used in the study, that would be enough to generate about 157 terawatt um, hour um, um, worth of electricity um, in these import countries. And that 157 terawatt hour of electricity is a very small fraction of the coal-fired electricity in China. For example, in China, um, based on the, the fourth column, um, it's about 3.3% of the total um, coal-fired electricity generation in China. It's about 13.5% of that of India, 46.3% of that of Japan and you know um, Taiwan is the only country where um, that amount of electricity actually exceeds the coal-fired electricity um, generation um, in that country. And um, based on the results, um, if that 157 um, terawatt hour of electricity generated from coal in the import countries were to be displaced by the um, US West Coast LNG, as proposed, then we would see uh, on a total life cycle emission um, <clears throat> basis, excuse me, we would see a 42% reduction um, in China of their um, greenhouse gas emissions and 49.8% you know, uh, reduction um, in India, 52.1% reduction in Japan, 54.8% uh, reduction in South Korea and about 37% reduction in, in, um, in Taiwan. Now, this is based on the total life cycle emissions. If we were to look at the individual um, absolute amount of what this translates to in CO2 equivalents per year, um, that would translate to about 71.4 uh, megaton of CO2 equivalent per year uh, in China and about 100 uh, megatons in India and more than 100 in, in South Korea and Japan and about you know, just under 50 um, in, in Taiwan. It is important to note that um, since this is a small part of say what is generated from coal as electricity in, in China, just about 3.3%, if this um, capacity were to be doubled, it means that it would double you know, the, the absolute amount of um, the, the, the net reductions in CO2 equivalent uh, per year. Um, however, increasing the capacity does not change, it does not affect <clears throat> on based on a life cycle basis, it does not affect the percentage reduction. So the more you increase how much um, you're exporting and using to displace coal-fired electricity, the more will be the net reductions uh, on an absolute amount of basis, but um, what would reduce the, uh, the baseline change, um, the second last column, the baseline change in the um, import countries life cycle emissions will be to actually um, reduce um, emissions in the life cycle stages of the LNG, uh, perhaps maybe you know, um, reduce upstream emissions or reduce um, you know, liquefaction emissions and things like that. Um, but all things being equal, um, if you double the, the capacity that you're exporting to, to displace coal-fired electricity, then um, the net um, 
savings in, in the net reductions in greenhouse gas emissions will also proportionally um, um, increase. Next slide, please. And um, from this study, um, a few comments you know, can be made. Um, obviously, we all know that energy demand is continuously um, growing and there is a need, um, despite the fact that um, it is all um, in everybody's interest um, to address the climate change and to um, you know, um, try to achieve the, the, the climate change targets that um, these countries have. Uh, it is important to note that um, Western United States natural gas can play a role as a bridge fuel um, in helping to achieve these GHG reduction goals um, because the demand potential um, for power generation continues to increase um, in these import countries that we have highlighted. And um, even though these figures that we have presented, um, you know, a lot of them are actually dated. And, um, you know, as technology continues to in improve and, you know, regulations continue to um, be updated and um, adoption of new, these new technologies in the extraction and processing production um, or, of natural gas continues to get better. Um, so will, you know, um, the, the total greenhouse gas emissions on a life cycle basis um, from, you know, processing and exporting, you know, natural gas, it will continue to decrease as the um, regulations continue to um, improve and the processes continue to improve. So there is um, a chance that even these figures that we have presented here are actually conservative because there is um, a continuous improvement as we all know. And um, you know, I, I think one of the, the, the big takeaways from, from this study would be that you know, energy exports you know, from, um, from the Western US um, resulting um, um, sourced from the um, can it, um, from the U.S. Rocky Mountains can, you know, both be, you know, economically and environmentally beneficial, you know, considering the net global GHG emissions reduction um, that will result from using it to displace coal-fired electricity um, generation in the import countries. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Adebola. I really appreciate that. Um, before we move to the um, Western States Tribal Nations perspective, I just want to make a couple of points, um, and, and, you, and you might have some comments to add to this as well. I wanted to uh, put on to the, uh, into the public uh, discussion the comment that I had made about replenishment, which was actually before we started the webinar. But one of the things that all of us who have studied um, U.S. Uh, natural resource industries, um, including oil and natural gas for a very long time. One of, the, one of the things that we know very well is how effective the industry can be in terms of replenishing itself. Um, as long as the industry continues to invest, then uh, the efficiency, um, the, the outcomes in terms of converting uh, resources um, reserves, booked reserves into production, replacing reserves that are consumed by production with um, new resources from what's in inventory. The industry has just been tremendously effective uh, on that front. Um, it's very efficient. We, we don't keep a lot in inventory. Um, this is something that's been done strategically in order to manage cost. Um, what the industry has has been able to do, especially um, in some of the more recent uh, developments, um, is to be very, very effective in terms of bringing um, reserves into production when they are needed. It still takes time, but we've been able to reduce the cycle times and all of that. And I think that's an important point to add to what you brought up about our resource base. The other point at Ebola that I would make um, with regard to power generation at the Baker Institute, we have a map um, that uh, is, is, uh, has been widely used actually by now, um, that shows the distribution of, of the Chinese uh, energy infrastructure and energy system. We count something like 3,000 or so, more than 3,000 coal-fired units in the country. Those are now installed. There are additional units on the way. Um, and, and so one of the important points I think that we have to think about here, while the share of coal 
in electric power generation in China has been falling a bit and will probably continue to fall. The, the amount of electricity uh, generated from coal is actually going to continue to increase as all of those new units come into, into uh, service. And the thing about that is that these are new. I think um, the average age that we've come up with, and I'm probably gonna be wrong about this, but I think it's probably eight or nine years. Um, so these are, these are new facilities that are going to be in operation for a very long time. And this is an important point because the emissions benefits I, that you've pointed out um, are going into a country that we rely on heavily for all of the equipment and components and materials associated with the alternative energy um, technologies that we're trying to increase. So what we have an opportunity to do here, and I hope that we'll talk about this more during the rest of the panel, we have an opportunity to actually offset um, some of those emissions generated to, to continue to install, to continue to, continue to provide capacity um, for wind and solar batteries um, and other components that we need as we move forward into the, into the future with cleaner burning natural gas. And this is not a small point in my mind. And I think it's something that, that we need to tease out. Now we have a, a couple of questions. I'm gonna defer questions until after Andrew um, and West do their part. Um, one thing I do want to state really quickly, um, and we will be talking about, um, you know, the challenges and export opportunities for the Western states. That's that's actually something that will have to come up. I also want to quickly respond to one question um, in the queue related to the data that Atabola used and whether it's it's still relevant um, for those who do not watch energy uh, patterns in China that closely, one of the things that we've all noticed is that as that country has come out of its um, pandemic um, and has gone into economic recovery, energy use has gone right back up to where it was before. Uh, China is taking more LNG than it ever has. Um, this is, we think, a, a prevailing pattern that we would expect to see around the world. It's certainly also happening in the United States as we go through economic recovery. So out of all, I just wanna give you a quick opportunity to add any other comments that you may have to the ones I made before we move on to Andrew. If anything. Uh, regarding the questions. Um, or just generally. I'm sorry, or just generally, yes. Um, just generally, um, I would say let's move on for now and we can have the discussion right after the presentation from Andrew and Wes. All right, good enough. All right, so Andrew is going to provide some context for this study, um, telling us a little bit about the Western States Tribal Nations Group. Um, Andrew? Thank you, uh, Michelle, and thank you uh, uh, to the Baker Institute for hosting us for this event. Um, Western States and Tribal Nations, uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. So we're a, we're a unique organization. Um, it is uh, an organization that was created by the states, uh, originally by uh, the state of Utah, the state of uh, Colorado, uh, and uh, the Ute Indian tribe uh, to address um, challenges with uh, stranded gas uh, in the Rockies. Uh, and the lack of opportunity to export and in, in to, to LNG markets in Asia. And, and we uh, created a couple of years ago, a, um, a report that, that essentially made the economic and technical case for Rockies gas as the, the natural feedstock uh, to supply uh, LNG markets in, in Asia. Uh, so this report also uh, called for the creation of, of a, a state and tribal government led Western states and tribal nations or a 501c4 um, and we're, we're focused on advancing uh, and finding markets for, for Western natural gas using uh, the bully pulpits of, of our state, tribal, and, and county governments. Uh, we're, we're a unique organization. Uh, I've been working uh, at the uh, kind of nexus of energy policy and, and politics for about 25 years. And this is the first organization I've, I've worked for that uh, was, was state-led. Uh, and I think, you know, this, this unique uh, public-private structure um, 
you know, uh, is a uh, is a special place in kind of this dialogue. Um, and so we uh, early on I go to the next stage. Next page, please. Early on, we um, identified uh, the, the uh, need to establish a technical baseline for for Rockies gas and where it fits in the kind of that global greenhouse gas uh, and energy energy geopolitics puzzle. Uh, and that's that's culminated in this report. Uh, let me get to our, our, our membership a little bit. Uh, so we are, um, our, our members are the, the tribes and states. Uh, we, um, the Ute Indian tribe uh, from Utah, the state of New Mexico, uh, the uh, state of Utah, state of Wyoming, uh, Black Hawk Energy, which is a Hikaria Apache a company also sits on our board. Uh, the state of Baja, California, Mexico, and this is, uh, this is the home of the, the Sempra Energia Costa Azul plant, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. Uh, the Southern Ute Indian Tribe and the Western Colorado counties of Garfield, Mesa, Moffat, Rio Blanco are our are, are members. This, uh, this um, letter on the side uh, was a, a letter that we sent to the Mexican Energy Secretary in support of uh, the uh, export permit uh, for um, Energia Costa Azul last year, and it, I think it underscores the what we bring to the table and the unique nature of our partnership in advancing our resources. Uh, next slide. So uh, I know Brian Lloyd is, is speaking after me, so I'm not gonna go too much in the Costa Azul plant. Uh, he'll give specifics on that. Uh, we are obviously uh, along with uh, Jordan Cove, and, and I'm sure there'll be questions on Jordan Cove later on. Uh, the Energia Costa Azul plant is a, a prime opportunity uh, for Rockies gas. As you see, our basins are represented by Green River, Uinta, Piance, San Juan uh, basins. Uh, this is almost 11 and a half uh, BCF, billion cubic feet a day uh, to, uh, to supply the, those markets. We have ample supply. Uh, we have a unique uh, bonding authority within our states. Uh, and we're looking at uh, doing an analysis on how we can, we can utilize this uh, bonding authority uh, to, to plug in any in infrastructure gaps uh, to, to bring uh, the, the amount of natural gas that would be needed for a, a LNG plant like uh, Energia Costa Azul to market. And we, we feel we have a, a reduced geopolitical risk. Um, you know, Mark, our LNG uh, terminals located on the North American uh, West Coast, you know, just have a, a, a bit of an advantage in terms of not having to go through um, uh, the Panama Canal uh, and all kind of in the kind of technical, technical and economic difficulties that may uh, entail. And so we've been we've been told by some of the our Asian uh, uh, allies that um, you know they're they're really uh, eager uh, and uh, excited about the concept of um, terminals on the North American West Coast to supply their markets. Next slide, please. So we are uh, much of our. Um, mission and, and priority is, is really uh, looking at the existing uh, uh, environment and how we can better brand uh, our, our market, our, our gas for, for markets. We are um, pursuing a, um, uh, a uh, proposal in front of the state of New Mexico's Energy Transition Act uh, Committee uh, that would establish an a ESG certification uh, uh, program at San Juan College uh, that would focus on um, developing curriculum and training for uh, workers displaced by um, closed coal-fired plants, coal, closed coal mines. Um, and um, we're, we have, a, I think, a, a, a fairly comprehensive uh, program that's, that's being considered uh, that will allow gradu graduates to go out and work for uh, some of these firms that are evolving and, and expanding rapidly in terms of monitoring, measuring, uh, verification, uh, of emissions reductions. Uh, this is, um, you know, this is a, a growing uh, uh, important uh, aspect of natural gas markets as, as companies such as Sempra uh, and um, some of the off takers of phase one uh, of that, that plant, uh, Total Mitsui, are looking to lower the, uh, the carbon content of their value chain you know, we're really working on lowering those upstream emissions, I think are, is important. Essentially, it's gonna be uh, the price of admission for, for any uh, uh, company uh, that's looking to export its uh, gas to Asian markets. Uh, next slide. 
We're also looking uh, at hydrogen, uh, concept of blue hydrogen and the role that that can play in, in the energy transition that's being offered by the Biden administration. They have uh, uh, in their infrastructure bill a proposal for uh, uh, blue hydrogen pilot plants uh, located in economically distressed natural gas producing uh, communities. Um, Senator Manchin also has a similar bill um, proposing about $15 billion for six six projects, uh, six blue hydrogen projects as well. Um, and so we're, we're examining where we can fit uh, into, into some of those, uh, those proposed uh, pilot projects. And we're, you know, we feel that the Western states with, with our uh, ample uh, natural gas supplies and our um, geology for carbon capture and sequestration uh, will, will be able uh, a, an ideal home to, uh, to, to many of those uh, pilot projects that are being uh, proposed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so, but we're here to talk about uh, the the our role in, in LNG markets and in reducing emissions uh, to to Asian the to uh, the uh, power generation sectors of Asian countries. Um, and I think uh, you know, we'll have a lot to talk about in the in the Q and A. But I would like to um, I uh, recognize the sponsors of this uh, study. This uh, this took a while to put together in a in a uh, COVID year. Uh, budgets were were strained, and um, but you know a lot of our allies and partners uh, stepped up uh, to uh, to because they felt that this was an important study uh, to to be developed. And so you, the the contributors contributors to this study, the Ute Indian Tribe, United Brotherhood of Carpenters, uh, Lyuna Colorado Laborers, uh, Duchesne County, Utah, Uinta County, Utah, the Utah School and Institutional Trust Land, Utah Governor's Office of Energy Development. Four Corners Innovation, Four Corners Economic Development, the Wyoming Energy Authority, and I'd like to like to thank them uh, for their contribution uh, to the study. Um, that's that's my overview. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Thanks, Andrew. And so, from the broader picture of the Western States Organization, let's go to Utah and Wes. Thank you, Michelle. I uh, appreciate that introduction, and Andrew, thank you for the acknowledgement there. As Michelle alluded to earlier, CITLA is kind of a unique agency. Um, we're a little bit separate from the, the general Utah Governor's Office of Energy Development, which would kind of support Utah at large. Our main goal is to look after our beneficiaries. And so that's kind of what I'll get into a little bit more of the background of who we are and kind of why we're here. Um, I would say we're akin to GLO in Texas, but more akin to the University of Texas Trust Lands kind of with mandate and what we're trying to do for our beneficiaries. Uh, we do try to match sophistication with industry. Um, and so, you know, I take my job very seriously and I think as do all the other uh, employees of the agency. So we can go to the, to the next slide here. Uh, just a little bit of a background on CILA. So we're a state agency, we were created in 1994 by a legislature to manage lands with really a highest and best use kind of mandate and that's statutory. Uh, the money we, we make goes into a permanent fund that's aimed at intergenerational benefit. And the permanent fund has grown from $50 million in 1994 to more than 2.6 billion today. And I really think that that has to do with the way we approach land management and resource development. Uh, I've do, provided some uh, graphics here that will give you guys a little bit of a reference on kind of what we do to generate revenue. Most of our revenue comes from mining, oil and gas, real estate development, and uh, surface industrial uses. So we do know there's renewables on the horizon, and we do have a new division being created for that aspect, but we don't yet have tangible revenues that we can really quantify. So as it relates to natural gas and what that's really done, for trust lines over the years is created about $650 million from royalty off of natural gas alone. Um, and that's coming from a relatively small position of our overall portfolio, which would be about 450,000 acres out of a 4.5 million mineral acre ownership. Um, at statehood, we were given seven and a half million acres, but we have divested some of the surface and minerals up until 1913 we are no longer allowed by statute to, to divest of minerals. So really we're talking about a rare opportunity to monetize these natural gas resources. We can't pick where the geology is, but we can try to maximize the benefit from that. So overall, the, the fund has 
received about 50 to 60% of its basis contributions from oil and gas activities. So if you look at the 2.6 billion, we really wouldn't have quite the leverage without oil and gas development here in Utah. And one thing I'd like to high note is that in 2020, uh, during the pandemic, that $20 million of the distribution to public schools was allocated to computers and tablets for remote learning. And so I think that that highlights kind of the added value that our agency has, that we are discretionary spending, that we are separated from the general fund and the tax base. So we survive on the money that we make and our beneficiaries see that benefit. If you look at the lower right graph here, um, on this slide, you'll see how our distributions annualized to the beneficiaries in particular public schools has gone up dramatically year over year since 2010 or, or 11. And so we're really proud of that fact and we're um, interested in continuing that trend into the future. Obviously with oil and gas development being very cyclical, we worry that a decrease in revenues can have an implication to the fund the fund is capped at a 4% max distribution to protect any type of downfall on in investments. But at the end of the day, we still wanna have a large fund that has a lot of momentum to yield a higher return uh, in the market. And so I think in 2020, we distributed 88 million and hopefully we're gonna approach north of $100 million to the public schools in the next couple of years. We could go to the next slide. And so, like I spoke before, this is really a rare opportunity. Um, SIL understands that more and more coal fired power generation is being displaced by natural gas in the domestic US. And we do believe that renewables play a role in the energy mix transition, but mass scale power generation requires large amounts of immediately dispatchable natural gas as a practical matter. And I think Dr. Kasuma's presentation really alluded to that, that there's large shares of energy uh, being created from electric, uh, from coal, uh, specifically power generation for electricity, but we're not really making a dent with natural gas or renewables in that share. And natural gas seems to be kind of with a leg up right now um, on that type of potential. So we do stand behind natural gas production as a cleaner fossil fuel. Uh, we think that it does enter the dialogue uh, globally um, for lowering greenhouse gas emissions. And, and that's really why Sitla wanted to get behind a credible research project that they could actually show our audience and kind of show us as land managers what we are standing behind and getting beyond rhetoric and believing in actual facts that are quantified. Um, so Utah here and the Rockies in general have constituted a stranded natural gas resource and so when we looked at where we could actually monetize natural gas reserves or um, unproven's, we looked at what do we have in the Green River of Wyoming? What do we have in the Piance um, of Colorado? You went to Basin of Utah and then San Juan, New Mexico. And what's interesting about this graphic I have here is how it shows really the connection that we have as states. We're, we're not gonna be able to achieve this type of opportunity individually we do need to collaborate and join forces because the geology is what's dictating that. So if you look at the overall Piance Uena uh, province here, that, that boundary really encompasses the Uena Basin of Utah, but also the Piance Basin of Western Colorado. And those are large producing natural gas basins, which have relatively, uh, have seen relative decline since probably 2012. And a lot of that is just due to domestic forces and kind of lower opportunity costs and, and natural gas basins elsewhere or associated gas production from Permian, et cetera. And so what we're looking at is an unassociated gas basin, a big basin here collectively between four states and the Rockies largely. And we're, we're looking at how we can monetize that. And so Dr. Kasuma did talk about how we have these reserves constituted um, and that ju did just give us a, an F95, F50, F5 type tabulation. And this is from USGS in 2019, showing in red, basically undiscovered continuous resources that we have potential to then, as Michelle Foss alluded to, grow even further through investment and drilling activity. So if we can go to the next slide. And then again, why we're engaged 
Um, you know, I wanted to keep this pretty simple. I have a, a graphic on here that just kind of shows where world electricity is coming from. Um, this is a quick Wikipedia source of 2020, but you know, we have, or excuse me, a 2018, but we have coal and natural gas combined 61% of the world electricity coming from these sources. And these aren't necessarily contemplating the new demand that's gonna be put onto the grid to power electric vehicles or electric battery vehicles. And so that I think provides us with an opportunity to kind of leverage natural gas production and, and be a part of that new demand. Uh, it's dispatchable, it's dependable, it's cleaner, and something's gonna to have to power renewables and the whole supply chain. So um, in order to manage our lands, I talked about this earlier, we're just looking for good measuring sticks. Um, and because we didn't really have anything to point to here in the Rockies basins per se, once we learned about Dr. Kasuma's original study for British Columbia gas, which was done in 2018, we felt like we could replicate the methodology and roll that out here locally. And so we began talking with Dr. Kasuma in about January of 2020. Um, and then we also engaged with the University of Utah because we felt that they had a ground level expertise. They understood the emission source environment, the geology environment, and they also had close proximity to the basin. So we felt like they're a really good candidate and they've been a great partner on the project overall. Um, but in the end, you know, we're looking for practical tools that can help our beneficiaries and help steer energy policies and establish markets um, while the renewable transition occurs. And so we do feel like this is a valid uh, platform to kind of talk about natural gas um, in a fair light. So um, with that, we can go to the next slide, Michelle. The last thing I would leave you all with is that we're just looking to continue the dialogue and I pulled some information here from the IEA um, and it just shows kind of the trajectory of coal demand through 2040. Those lines in uh, blue and red would be representative of what would happen under like the recovery post COVID or just under the, um, I gotta read your, uh, well, it's pretty small, but it would be the, uh, the, the delayed recovery scenario. And then we have a sustainable development scenario in green dipping down lower. Um, you know, that would be something where maybe natural gas can help us get on a trend to kind of lower emissions from coal by displacement with natural gas. And so the, the small font in the diagram says it as predicted under the steps, which is basically current policies in place aimed at steering resource development, show at least a 30% increase in demand for natural gas through 2040. Um, but you know, even with that demand increase, we still see a heavy reliance on coal here. Um, and so I think this is pretty uh, impactful uh, visual aid to show what natural gas has an opportunity to help displace as far as coal reliance, um, while also helping achieve maybe sustainable development plans because we haven't necessarily considered carbon capture in this equation. Um, and that is an upside if we have a greener gas while capturing carbon through its end use. So uh, that's kind of where we're at from Sitla's perspective, really interested in kind of national benefits, Rocky Mountain regional benefits, and, and global benefits with natural gas. All right, thank you, Wes. Um, so let's just take a quick few minutes before Brian steps to the plate. Um, there are some, some questions um, that we can tee off now and probably come back to again later. Um, one in particular, this is a big one. Um, so I'll give you all a chance to tackle it because um, you know it is, it is probably the ultimate challenge, and that is export outlets. Um, uh, Brian will speak to Costa Azul, and gas suppliers will be competing to provide feed gas for Costa Azul for export. Um, what else is on deck? Many of us have been following the other projects. There are challenges in getting West Coast locations for 
LNG exports. I think um, it would help for you all to provide your perspective on those um, and what you see the possibilities as being and, um, and, and perhaps provide some thoughts that could help people think about the benefits of allowing projects to go forward on the West Coast. When you look at the results of, of, of this effort, along with all of the other considerations that Wes in particular has lined out here, um, why should we continue to think about that? Why should we try to build support for West Coast export locations? So I'll, I'll leave it to you all, who, whoever wants to go first to step to the plate to talk about that aspect of, of what you all are doing. Andrew? Yeah. Wes? Andrew, you, you might comment on that too, but I, you know, from Utah's perspective, we need a catalyst. I think what we need is to firm up an offtake agreement and, and we need to have representative viability to do that. So if, if we have a viable West Coast LNG export option and the reserves available, the, the rest will kind of fall in place. But we really do need these Asian countries to really see this opportunity, engage in a long-term offtake agreement that could support additional drilling in the Rockies. You know, this has always been an economic question for us because once prices on gas dropped below $2 in MCF, so did drilling in the Rockies. And so we kind of saw a loss of market share there, but I think we're entering a new realm, right? With greener uh, and sustainable development practices. And so with the balances and the efficiencies the industry has right now, we're looking for innovation to help support reasonable returns on production in the Rockies and the first step is to show what we actually have to sell or what we have to offer. Andrew? Yeah, thank you, Wes. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, there, there's Enerhia Costa Azul. Uh, Jordan Cove uh, was a, a, a project. It's, it's now kind of been put in hibernation by the parent company, uh, Pembina. And I'd say, um, you know, part of the, the you know, the, the rationale of the formation of our organization is, is the political challenges of citing a project on the North American West Coast and particularly the U.S. Western states because uh, British Columbia is looking at its uh, uh, shell project uh, as well. I think they've already made FID on that. Um, you know, part of the, you know, part of the rationale, of, as I mentioned, the formation of this organization was Jordan Cove. A couple of years ago, we got on, we went uh, on the ground in Oregon uh, to show the broader support of our network and, and what this Jordan Cove would mean to the Rocky States in terms of uh, economic development and opportunity for our rural communities, uh, participated in a number of FERC hearings. And that the, the primary argument against LNG pro, the, the Jordan Cove LNG project offered by the public officials, the governor's office and the, the, the other public officials uh, was climate change. Uh, that that this, this would um, prevent uh, Oregon, the project would prevent Oregon from meet it, meeting its uh, 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 Paris Accord um, obligations and therefore, um, that and I guess eminent dom domain was a reason not to have the project. And so, you know, that is as 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 you may guess, we didn't agree with that assessment. You know, we felt that was looking at the project in a silo, and that you know you needed to look at the the broader benefits of exporting gas and what exactly it would be doing uh, uh, in the Asian markets, what it would be displacing, and so. Uh, we decided early on that we needed a, a, to uh, establish a, you know, a bulletproof technical uh, baseline for that. Um, so that's going to be, that's going to continue uh, to be uh, a challenge. Uh, but I think this, this report is, is a, a step in the right direction and in, in in an attempt to uh, convince the Biden administration uh, as it, it considers its, its federal leasing programs that the hard data from this report will help it meet help that administration meet its, its, uh, its, its uh, global environmental objectives while helping our rural communities and tribal economies. Um, so it is, uh, as, as Wes said, we, we're, we're looking to establish a beachhead. We think we have a comparative advantage. We have the gas and we're making the technical arguments right now. 
One other quick question for you all um, before moving on. Um, pipeline capacity, existing, planned, and, and if you could respond to that, especially in terms of the bonding authority that you mentioned, that's, that's an interesting um, dynamic to consider. Um, you have to be able to get the gas to the, the plant inlet. So uh, could you just quickly comment on that? Current connections, future connections, and what the states can actually really do with that bonding authority. So uh, there, the Enerhia Costa Azul currently has uh, um, a, a sourcing gas through it for, has gas source for its phase one uh, plant. And I'll let, I'll let Brian uh, talk a little bit more about kind of the, the different phases and the build out of that project. The, the second phase is, is gonna be quite a bit more gas. Uh, the current capacity does not exist. Um, we are, uh, we are uh, currently kind of putting together an analysis of, of where uh, the best routes might be, where there could be um, existing rights of way, uh, while looking at kind of the, uh, the permitting challenges in this, in this current environment and, um, and, and frankly, where, where the states could, could help uh, fill in the gaps. And so I don't want to give away too much right now because we're just kind of starting that, uh, that, uh, that analysis. But, you know, there, there are a number of different ways uh, you know, including um, uh, the existing uh, system, um, El Paso system, uh, as well as uh, pipelines coming out of uh, uh, Utah and through the San Juan Basin. So um, go ahead. I'm sorry, I thought someone was interjecting. Uh, so so we, we we're, we're putting pen to paper on um, kind of where the best routes uh, would be and and you know, we've looked at the, the state of uh, Utah, the state of uh, New Mexico, and, and Wyoming in particular has, has very kind of specific bonding authority for gas infrastructure uh, inside the state of Wyoming or outside the state of Wyoming. Um, there has not, where the, the, the concept of kind of a state gas compact or a, a bundled approach uh, has really not been uh, done before as, as, as far as we know, we've looked at kind of other precedents uh, and so we're looking at what that what that might look like, and, and we think um, you know, it's a good opportunity for our states to exercise that authority uh, to develop uh, a market uh, for export for their gas. Interesting. Wes, I was thinking Wes had some comments. Uh, you know, yeah, the, it's it's complicated. I think that it would require some additional build out eventually with pipeline, but there are kind of opportunities that we can take advantage of now. Um, you know, as it stands with current infrastructure, because production in the Rockies and in Utah has been on a decline since roughly 2012, we do have probably a, at least 40% additional capacity in some of these lines. And so we can ramp up pretty much immediately for this incremental LNG takeaway. Um, and, you know, I think it happens in phases. Phase one would be kind of proof of concept, getting the first contracts in place and then growth of production there. Okay. All right, great. I want to move on to Brian, um, but just mention that there was a, another interesting question on the table that I think needs um, larger treatment. And I'm, I'm hoping that, that as a buyer of, of gas or a, 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 you know, an intaker of gas, Brian might have some thoughts on this. And that um, was whether the work that Adebola and, and his colleagues have done, how that would look if you include other basins and other um, supply sources um, in the United States and, and, and really uh, across North America to include uh, the Canadian suppliers there themselves. And I would only add one thought on that myself, which is that every basin is different. Geology is different. Um, the composition of production streams is different. Um, we have an abundance of natural gas that's associated with liquids. Um, all of these present particular challenges, but they are, can all be managed. And the reason why I want to burden Brian with this is because Sempra has staked out a position, um, like many other companies, uh, to convey publicly what you intend to do in terms of managing um, your own balance sheet with regard to your environmental um, metrics. And so I'm, I'm hoping that you can comment on all of this as part of um, what you are going to communicate to us on your assets and your strategy. So Brian? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Michelle. Thanks to, to the Baker Institute, uh, as well as um, the Western States 
Tribal Nations Group for, for sponsoring today. I'm Brian Logan of Semper Energy and Semper LNG. Since, since we're talking about Pacific Coast LNG exports today, I thought I'd start with a picture of what that's going to look like. Um, and this is our, our Energy Costa Azul plant that we started construction of about 15 years ago. It is um, and was the first regasification terminal on the west coast of North America. Now, as we all know, since we started that construction, uh, American Ingenuity has unlocked vast new supplies of natural gas across the U.S., including much of the western U.S. that we've talked about today, the Permian Basin in Texas and New Mexico. So we're in the process of adding uh, three and a half million tons per year of export capacity to this facility. We have 20-year contracts with affiliates of Total, the French energy major, and Mitsui and company. Uh, and Total will also be about a 16% equity partner in the project as well. So we think uh, ICA, as we call it, ICA LNG is a perfect example of this global cooperation that we, we do believe and are aligned with the view that it will advance lower carbon energy with uh, European and Asian trading houses and energy companies partnering with us and North American energy infrastructure company. Um, and, and I'd be remiss to not sort of talk about the cooperation of the government of Mexico to issue their, their required export permits in that country as well. So we're excited about this project. It was the only LNG project to go to a final investment decision last year. Uh, the team did an excellent job kind of moving us in the midst of the pandemic and, and, and other issues. Uh, if you want to flip to the next slide. And this, this will start to touch on, on some of what Michelle mentioned. Um, for those of you who don't know Semper Energy, we're, we're sort of, uh, we're kind of a unique animal in the energy space uh, today. And so I did want to kind of place our LNG products in a little bit broader of a view of the businesses that we're in, in our view of the energy transition. And, and I will say again, that we do think the work by Dr. Kasumu, WSDN, Utah State, the others that supported this study validates really our underlying thesis that we do believe it is very important to provide lower carbon energy to the places of the world where we know 90% of the growth in energy demand is going to occur. That's, that's particularly the Asian country. So we operate regulated electric and natural gas utilities in California and Texas. And we have an unregulated energy infrastructure business that operates across the broad swath of the energy industry in Mexico, as well as our LNG business, which is, is primarily focused in export terminals in North America. Now, most companies have at this point chosen to focus either in regulated markets or unregulated markets or domestically and internationally. And we're, we're sort of one of the few that are, have this interesting mix of things. And so, so why do we have that? Fundamentally, I would say we believe that all of our companies are performing the same core function. And that is building infrastructure to connect customers with what they're increasingly demanding, which is lower carbon energy or in some cases, zero carbon energy. So for example, we have San Diego Gas and Electric, in Southern California operates a grid with 40 to 45% renewable energy on it. That's only going to grow. Has four leaning programs on transportation, electrification, and energy storage. Southern California Gas Company is the largest natural gas distribution utility in, in the company. Um, it is one of the nation's leaders in advancing renewable natural gas. It's methane captured from landfills, dairy for, farms, and other sources that currently go straight in the atmosphere. And so instead, SoCal Gas has a number of programs to capture that gas and inject it into the system with the goal of having 20% of the gas supplied to their California customers be renewable gas by the end of the decade. Uh, SoCal Gas also has a number, and I'm glad Andrew mentioned this, sort of hydrogen and power to gas research, development and demonstration projects. And so here again, really the grid and the pipelines are what is critical to connecting customers to these lower carbon energy sources. Here in Texas, um, for those of you who don't know us, again, our platforms are Encore Electric Delivery, which is the state's largest transmission distribution utility, and Sherryland Utilities, which operates transmission assets in the Rio Grande Valley, connecting thousands of megawatts of renewable energy to Texas's power grid as those electrons continue to get cleaner and cleaner in the state. At the same time, a large chunk of what Encore is doing these days is connecting oil and gas wells in the Permian to a power grid that is increasingly low carbon. So you can see some of what we think are some virtuous cycles here of, of increasingly using lower and lower carbon energy to produce oil and, and, and gas and improve that emissions profile as well. Our unregulated energy platform, again, we really view fundamentally as doing the same. When you think of our Mexico best, uh, uh, platform, our subsidiary Ianova has long connected natural gas resources in the United States to Mexican markets. 
Mexican consumers and Mexican industry to have cleaner sources of energy than what they historically have or would otherwise use. And so we have we have, have renewable expansion, we have pipeline networks, we have local gas distribution companies that we think, again, is a great is, has great growth potential in expanding the use of natural gas um, from the U.S. In, in to Mexico. And, and just sort of finally, our LNG platform, again, we think exactly the same thing. What, the, what our infrastructure in the LNG space is fundamentally about is connecting America's natural gas resources to the parts of the world that don't have domestic so sources adequate to substitute for coal, oil, other higher carbon goals. So I said this in some other forms and, and I like putting it this way. We, we really, don't, we're not on this webinar and we don't strive to look for data to justify an LNG business from a greenhouse gas perspective. We are in the LNG business because we truly believe it has net greenhouse gas benefits to the globe. Every cargo of LNG, when used to displace coal fired generation, produces a net benefit of 200,000 metric tons reduction in global greenhouse gas emissions. Every use of LNG as a marine shipping fuel provides a quarter reduction in greenhouse gas emissions over the use of typical marine fuels. And importantly to us, this is a technology that is here today and available in providing these emissions benefits. We, we as, as you can probably guess, we're, we're big believers in, in the energy transition. We're big believers in continued growth and technologies and other things, but we think we can't let this low hanging fruit um, kind of go for the benefit of the globe. Uh, next slide, please. So as you gather and here kind of shrinking down to our LNG platform, we, we are one of our other unique characteristics is this platform and portfolio of projects we have that's located really on both on two of America's coasts, the Gulf Coast, where our Cameron LNG project, it's a 12 million ton per year export project with this phase one reaching commercial operation last year. We have a project in Port Arthur, Texas that we are developing that um, the first phase will, will be similarly 10 million tons per year of export capacity with additional phases that can follow that. And then on the Pacific Coast, we have ICA LNG. Andrew mentioned we have a couple phases. Our phase one that I've talked about, again, three and a half million tons of export capacity. As the regasification contracts roll off, we, we are looking at a much larger project that would be around a 10 million ton per year export project in ECA LNG. Since, since there was the question on, on uh, pipeline infrastructure, for ECA small scale, there's a few upgrades that we'll be doing in conjunction with others on both the US and Mexican side to, to um, add some compression and add some, some additional pipe in Mexico. Um, the larger scale project will need a substantial new pipeline, either from the Permian Basin elsewhere in the West. And so those are, those are efforts we continue to kind of work on and, and, and look at, again, how can we provide a robust access to a set of different basins? Because as I mentioned, we do this business in the way where we do 20% uh, 20 year uh, sales and purchase agreements or, or a tolling arrangement in Cameron. And so we know over the course of those 20 years, you're gonna see shifts in, in gas supply, gas demand and, and configuration of the pipeline network. So. One of the things we pride ourselves on is having our buyers that, that utilize our infrastructure have access to multiple basins and be resilient for those things. Um, our latest project is a little bit further down the coast in Mexico. It's called Vista Pacifico. It's uh, interior to the Sea of Cortez, but again, it still per, uh, enables access to Asian markets without going through the Panama Canal. And again, with substantially fewer uh, emissions on the shipping side. This will be sized similarly to ECA LNG, about three to four million tons per year in, in its initial phase. Unlike ECA phase two, we do believe that there's existing pipeline capacity in the US and Mexico that we think we can move additional volumes off the West Coast of North America. We've received export authorizations for our free trade partners for Vista Pacifico from the Department of Energy, and we're hopeful that the non-free trade agreement countries will be coming in coming months as we continue the work for planning for this terminal. So in our view, and I know Anna's gonna get into this more, the geopolitical trade and other benefits of these projects are huge. They're huge to the United States. They're huge to producers and producer states and producer tribes. Um, they are, are huge to Mexico. These uh, ECO will provide thousands of jobs in its construction phase to, to, uh, to um, Mexican citizens in the Baja area hundreds of permanent jobs as these facilities, again, are, are long life assets. Um, and even in Mexico, we believe these facilities will ultimately help bring natural gas to parts of Mexico that don't have it today. Think Baja California, sir, that, that southern tip of Baja California. At the same time, Asian uh, customers have made it abundantly clear that again, one of their quickest ways of, of rapidly reducing greenhouse gas emissions and meeting some of the interim goals under the Paris Agreement are using 
uh, uh, LNG, including US LNG in place of local coal resources. So not just China, but places like Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, other, other parts of, of Asia that again, have rapidly growing energy demands and, and their choice will ultimately be buying gas from the United States or buying gas from partners that we think are ultimately less reliable than the US. So to, to Michelle's point, I wanna mention this finally, if you wanna to go to the, the last slide there, These are uh, a couple of snips from uh, Semper Energy's corporate sustainability report that we released a few uh, weeks ago. This is our 13th annual report. We, we do pride ourselves on being leaders in this area. And, and we have in fact established a net zero by 2050 goal that includes all of our operating companies and across all scopes. So I, I, what you should take from this is we believe having a growing, thriving LNG business is completely compatible with these goals. And again, I would say when you think of the global challenge, we think absolutely necessary. And again, the, the, the research by Dr. Kasumu and, and others, I, we think kind of bears that out. So a couple of things I wanna highlight here, we have an existing goal already to operate our existing LNG infrastructure at a greenhouse gas intensity level 20% below our, our permitted baseline. ECA LNG is gonna use state-of-the-art aeroderivative turbines to power the plants, which are very low greenhouse gas emitting versus other technologies. And, and we think that's going to make ECA LNG one of the lowest carbon LNG terminals in the world. Beyond that, and, and, and to, uh, to, um, to Abadola's point earlier, we're not standing still. So we continually and are actively looking at ways of making the liquefaction process even lower emitting. And that's things like using electric driven compressors paired with high amounts of renewable energy or zero carbon energy um, from, from our utility providers. We are actively looking at take, adding carbon capture to our facilities to take the CO2 from the feed gas, permanently sequester that CO2 in Gulf Coast reservoirs. A little more of a challenging thing in Baja, California, uh, but we are looking at, at maybe converting that to other forms of carbon in, in Mexico kind of down the road. So we do think we ultimately can get the liquefaction process um, as we continue to, to build out these facilities pretty darn close to net zero. We're also firm believers in the need to improve the emissions upstream and downstream of us. Um, I, I think we, we have taken the position, like many of the Western states have, that we've got to work to, to end routine venting and flaring. We have to improve the emissions profile of the upstream. Ultimately, we believe global customers are going to demand and require that. We think and, and are actively working with others toward differentiated gas markets. Again, how can we grade producers, basin suppliers on their greenhouse gas intensity um, as a way of helping our customers and helping others quantify those emissions and ultimately offset them, if that's a thing that, that they are interested in doing. We do believe there has to be ultimately consistent forms of measurement and verification across all countries of origin, because we do think ultimately the U.S. is one of the most transparent environmental regulatory regimes in the world, and we believe that we, we should be disadvantaged for that. We very much kind of want, want our, our gas graded in the same way that, that uh, gas from other sources need to be created as well. So the, la the last point I'm going to leave with is that we also think that LNG infrastructure can play a critical role in enabling much of this next generation of energy technology. Andrew mentioned some of the work the Western states are doing on hydrogen. We're again looking actively in this area as well. Hydrogen and ammonia as derivatives of natural gas that can provide increasingly clean energy um, we think, again, LNG infrastructure can help accelerate this. So if you take, take a facility like our Cameron LNG facility, natural gas export facility has natural gas hookups. As we look to add things like carbon capture to capture some of the carbon there, we start to have what we think will look like a ready-made site to perhaps at some point do hydrogen and do blue hydrogen and capture the carbon there, both for use domestically along the Gulf Coast, but potentially down the road for export, either as hydrogen or in, in the form of ammonia. Um, and so we, we really, as, to, to kind of wrap with, with where I started, we do think the trends in both electricity and gas markets are, are consistent across our businesses. And that's ultimately to have cleaner and cleaner electrons and then to have cleaner and cleaner molecules. And we think there's a suite of things that the world's gonna need to do between now and 2050 to really make the progress in this area. And so I'll, I'll end there, uh, Michelle, and um, turn, it over, turn it back to you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, before I let you go and, and turn to Anna for the global wrap, let me ask you kind of a tough question. Um, Costa Azul is impressive, right? I finally made it there after a gazillion years of working on projects in Mexico a couple of years ago. Andrew and Wes were along 
on that trip as an industrial facility is, is really a, a, a beautiful place, frankly. Um, for those of us who appreciate industrial facilities, and I have a deep appreciation of them, um, can you put Costa Azul in context with other West Coast LNG developments? Andrew uh, tackled the question a bit of Jordan Cove, but we have Canada as well, and we have developments in British Columbia. So can you just kind of give us a, a feel for how you all see these shaping up um, for the Asia Pacific Basin? Uh, where are you all in your development path relative to some of the other uh, projects? Yeah, great. so great question. So uh, again, sort of we've gone final investment decision on ECA uh, LNG phase one. Um, you know, ECA as an LNG export facility really started as thinking about what do we do when the regasification contracts roll off. So we, we actually initially started with the very large scale project as the one we had in mind and then sort of realized, well, rather than wait for the later part of the 2020s, we found a way to actually add this sort of mid-scale, what we call the mid-scale project kind of within the existing footprint that can coexist with the regasification plan. So that project is underway. We expect first LNG in 2024, which we are hoping is going to make it the first export facility on the West Coast and in a little bit of a race with, with LNG Canada up there. What we do think that our projects in sort of off the Mexican coast provide is access to U.S. gas basins that, that is, is unique. Uh, the, the Canadian projects generally are looking to, and are, we think will be more tied to Canadian gas supplies. Again, we think that the, the nimbleness of the US gas industry, the number of diverse basins that we ultimately um, want to have access at as terminal to, we think it's a competitive advantage. Uh, because again, we do think that over, over time, whether it is from Western states, whether it's from the Permian basin, we think that's going to be um, among the most competitive supply of natural gas uh, to, to the rest of the world, particularly Asia. Um, now, candidly, um, and we sort of talked some about this, you, you know, when you look at, at, again, some of the upstream emission things, um, you know, Texas is continuing to make progress on that and producers in the Permian are making progress on that area there. We, we think that's accelerating. And so again, we think some of the, the initiatives the Western states have done may ultimately make that gas very attractive from a greenhouse gas uh, emissions perspective there. So again, we, we think we're, we're, we're pretty pretty jazzed on our, on our West Coast projects. And we think again, that access to US producers and US gas markets is gonna be a bit of a differentiator for us. Excellent. So Anna, global wrap. Yes, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, indeed, uh, I think my remarks will try to um, basically underscore the global um, issues and the global trends that we have seen um, over time and that we, we are projected to be seeing uh, going forward. In many ways, they will bring a lot of the arguments that my, the speakers before me have put up um, and, and kind of, uh, in a way, summarize them, hopefully, um, if I can get the next slide. I want to just start with a quick overview of, of what's going to be happening in the population and energy space uh, globally uh, from now on um, going forward. So already uh, at this moment, the developed countries are far outweighed in terms of population uh, by the developing countries. And going forward, that's where we're going to see the growth in population through 2050 and, to, to, and uh, 2100, really. Uh, we will see the growth in population in Africa, Asia, countries will, will, that are developing, uh, I mean, uh, regions that are developing them, um, uh, economically. And in, in that, they will need a lot of energy, a lot of affordable, reliable um, energy that they, ac they can access um, easily. And in that way, this, we will see kind of this, uh, this, this dissonance or this differences, these dis differences that we will be looking at between the developed and developing world. And in the, in, in the gas, na natural gas space is what we kind of um, have, uh, have named the, the, the differences between the old and new world of, of gas demand. Next slide, please. Um, we have... Um, uh, adapt this old new uh, demand, um, uh, world of demand in natural gas in our book. Um, uh, the one that Michelle has mentioned at the very beginning, which um, she invited me to co-edit. Um, and we talked about the differences with the old world of demand for gas, this developed world where um, the uh, gas of demand has already grown, is at a high level that includes, uh, or it involves quite a lot of already existing infrastructure. It's also developed economically 
quickly, so it won't grow as much uh, going forward. Now, the new world of demand is where gas is already used, but it also has a huge perspective of being used more in the future. And that goes back to the, all the comments previous about developing Asia in particular, uh, needing new energy resources, needing new cleaner energy resources that could replace coal that currently is used at a large scale. And not only contributes to greenhouse gas emissions, but also contributes to the issues of, uh, of air quality, the discount countries are acutely aware of. So this is something that we will see the push for, for, for cleaner uh, fuels. However, as I've mentioned slide, uh, before, the push for cleaner fuels will stop where the economic development also stops. So when, 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 uh, when the push for cleaner, cleaner fuels could endanger fast economic development, we might see the, uh, the, 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 the result of going back to um, dirtier fuels like coal, uh, and and for uh, and this can be an int imp important element of the future. As Michelle has noted, um, we see that a lot of the coal generation is now being built. So going forward, it will continue, um, you know, uh, polluting into into the future. So what can what can be done, and how can these two worlds be uh, be brought together? Um, I brought up here the different uh, natural gas consumption scenarios, which we have um, uh, pointed out in uh, in one of the chapters um, of the book uh, on monetizing natural gas, and kind of shows that in most of the scenarios we see growth of uh, gas consumption um, in the in the developing world, in the new world uh, of, the, uh, of, of gas demand. Um, in some specific scenarios where net zero or rapid transition, this might be dif different in terms of a, a slight decrease um, in uh, parts of the, of the world. But in general, the developing world will grow consumption. The interesting part is that the predictions, particularly that come from Asia, like from the from the Japanese outlets, are much more bullish on natural gas than those that are coming, for example, from Europe, which reflects kind of this, this attitude that we have been seeing uh, in a way that uh, different regions of the world not only use gas or not only, uh, uh, not only their demand, but also how they view um, gas and generally energy transition going forward. Can I have the next slide? That being said, it's even though currently a lot of the gas comes from um, US and Australia and so on, the, the truth is that a lot of most of the natural gas reserves are actually in non-OECD world. So as the developed world potentially moves to fewer um, fossil fuels and even decreasing supply of natural gas, we might see a move in the non-OECD countries to produce its own gas. And so decrease in supply of fuels such as natural gas in, um, in developed world doesn't necessarily mean that, that this, this, the sum of supply, the, the global supply decreases as potentially we do see other resources that could step in. Now, whether that's, uh, that's beneficial or not, that can, be, uh, that can be argued, but for sure there are some specific benefits to especially US LNG as a fuel going forward. And they have been brought up by, by, uh, by speakers earlier. Uh, when we talk about the Western gas, there is this risk of reduce the reduction of geopolitical risk. When we talk about generally uh, increased supply of available gas from suppliers that are not necessarily tied also to specific state entity, but actually use market rules as the direction of, the, of where the supply is going. That's also one of the geopolitical benefits that we will see going forward. This might not necessarily be the case if the supply of natural gas is taken over by countries where, where um, where we see state entities rather than a market um, directing the way that supply can be um, uh, shared. Uh, next slide, please. And this is actually a, another slide that reflects our view of, of how um, different areas of the world um, set up the significance of markets versus governments around the world and goes back to the, to the 
ish, to the idea that US supply provides a much more market oriented supply, which gives us the benefit, the geopolitical benefits of energy security. And that goes back again to uh, issues of well, will countries in the developing world that grow their uh, they grow their economies that want that need more affordable, reliable fuel, will they want LNG as part of the supply? Particularly that in many cases they need to import it. If they need to import it, well, in that case, coal becomes somewhat more competitive particularly if this is a domestic resource on the basis of energy security considerations. The more energy security, the more, the more secure LNG supply will be, the more likely or the more, the more likely is it gonna be competitive against coal in, part, in, in, in places like Asia, but also in Europe, especially Central and Eastern Europe where I, where I uh, do a lot of my research on because it will have that, that benefit of a more stable uh, su supply that can be accessed. And US is a great source for that, um, as opposed to many part, uh, many major, uh, uh, major U um, LNG suppliers like Qatar or Russia, US suppliers are not tied directly to the government. Uh, the supply cannot be easily stopped by policy measure and is generally not dependent on policy measures. So while markets are not necessarily always uh, predictable, uh, they are at the very least not tied to um, a certain policy decision that is completely, that might be completely not predictable by anyone um, uh, and can be tied to specific geopolitical uh, influence. We've seen this especially in Russia and its, its dominance over uh, natural gas supply in Central and Eastern Europe. And um, I will go back to this, talking a little bit about Nord Stream 2, which Ken has already uh, touched upon. Uh, next slide, please. So we see the significance of US LNG supply, particularly first as we go through 2010 to 2020, um, more volume, of course, the higher supply, the, the better it is, it provides um, lower prices, um, higher energy security and so on, but also flexibility. That's another um, unique feature that US LNG has brought into the market, natural gas markets, providing um, FOB, so free on board gas that can be, you know, as soon as picked up, it can be actually distributed to wherever the buyer wants it to be, which is a huge um, benefit if, because those buyers can also exercise arbitrage um, uh, against uh, at at the point of um, uh, at the point of uh, um, of the uh, of the sale. Um, in addition, the contracts a lot of a lot of contracts are either short term or on the spot, and this really has helped kind of invigorate the markets, provide higher flexibility, not only by providing new. Um, a new supply with higher flexibility, but also because other suppliers like Russia, for example, have been adjusting to the new rules that US LNG as a competitor provides. We've seen this very well in Europe. Um, for example, uh, take or pay um, uh, rules have been changed in many of the Russian, uh, Russian co long-term contracts. Um, to much lower, 75% of an, uh, levels, and we've seen it actually. I've seen actually actors in Europe using that those, that flexibility under the under COVID when LNG at the beginning of 2020 had been a very low um, prices. They were actually able to buy quite more of it and stop some of the Russian supply that otherwise would be would be brought on a long term contract basis. So this is big a big um, advantage that US LNG has provided not only to specific buyer, but buyers, but to generally to, to, to the global uh, market. Next slide, please. And we've seen also that um, LNG has shown, in general, LNG has kind of made the mar market a little bit more nimble. It's provided, depending on the prices, the, the LNG goes to different parts of the world. When we see, as I mentioned in Europe, uh, um, prices were higher or at the same level as prices in Asia at some point in 2020, we've seen a huge uh, uh, amount of LNG going there. When 
part, uh, can, uh, where prices in Asia has have been driven up earlier this year, the situation reverted. It really helps to have additional supply that's easily uh, moved to different parts of the world like the, U, uh, like the US supply to protect the market from, from higher, uh, higher swings and, uh, and, in, and invite quite a lot of economic, um, or qu quite, a, quite a lot of benefits also for the buyers. And next slide. And this is exactly what I've been talking about in terms of US LNG supply dynamics in Europe. So one thing what, that people have been often underscoring is that US LNG in Europe is not gonna be the main source for gas. And that's true. It's not as competitive as generally cheaper Russian gas. Um, however, at points where it, the, the gas supplies, global gas supplies become uh, readily available, cheaper, it can be brought at spot market. And that's a great benefit to those who have availability or who, who can access that through LNG terminals and so on. And LNG terminals, have, have, you know, we have a lot of ter LNG terminals in Western Europe, Increasingly, Central Eastern Europe, Southeast Europe has brought some, Poland, Lithuania, now Croatia, they have gotten this access. And this points to another very important element that LNG, um, US LNG provides. And generally LNG provides there is this ability to, uh, to be, a floor, be a ceiling for prices uh, for other suppliers like specifically Russia. This is a big, uh, big uh, element of um, uh, benefit that um, US LNG can provide in Europe, other places as well, being nimble, uh, being uh, flexible, and additional part of the flexibility that we've learned and a lot of supply, uh, um, a lot of demand centers have, have really benefited from it during COVID um, is the ability to actually even cancel or defer um, a lot of volume that US um, uh, LNG suppliers produce. This is a big benefit that they were able to exercise that otherwise would not be available for them. Um, and in that, uh, it, it, it benefits, uh, again, the, the depth of the market, the, um, the ability to move uh, volumes where they need it at that, um, at that uh, specific point. Going to back to Nord Stream 2 and why is it kind of this, this intro, US LNG um, is a, is a, should or could Play, uh, play a role there. Uh, together with my colleague, a colleague uh, Gabe Collins, we have written this um, research since 2018. We actually have uh, uh, published several papers on this, where we argued that um, as long as um, there is a, enough infrastructure in any place, but particularly here in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, enough access to infrastructure, but uh, both in terms of LNG supply and interconnectors, that the ability of countries to manage uh, their energy security becomes greater. Um, LNG supply becomes vital because, as I've mentioned, it becomes the ceiling for prices, but also makes it impossible for dominant supply to extract geopolitical uh, influence or geopolitical benefits. Um, now, part, and Nord Stream 2 has been highly criticized on both sides of the aisle in the US as one that could discourage uh, or that could uh, hurt energy security because uh, it would bring quite a lot of nat uh, natural gas from Russia, potentially kind of killing the competition otherwise. Um, and hence, we've seen actually push for sanctions uh, by, by the US um, uh, that would kill the pipeline, even though at this moment is around 100 miles, uh, that, uh, there are 100 miles that need to be completed um, uh, of the pipeline. Now, the Biden administration has imposed very limited sanctions on the pipeline. Um, and what we argue is that actually sanctions are not as useful as potential geo geoeconomic collaboration between US and Europe. In a way, US could engage in bringing in a lot of infrastructure um, that could bring in to those countries that are uh, the, where Russia is dominant, could bring another supply that could become not only just supply that is delivered, but just a credible threat that would make Russia to, uh, be, uh, to behave just like a regular 
a supplier not uh, having geopolitical influence over other parts of the world and over countries in Eastern Europe, such as Ukraine, Poland, Lithuania, and so on. And in that, by exercising mar market type of um, actions, we would be able to create a better geopolitical conditions within, um, within the region. I'll stop at that, thank you. Thanks, Anna. Um, so to wrap all of this up in the next few minutes, um, let me just summarize quickly what you just said. Um, a role for US LNG in impacting um, geopolitical security, let's say, um, through competitive supply markets um, that allow uh, a resource um, to compete um, on a heads up basis. Um, as, as a way of helping to, to balance um, the various interests uh, on the European continent. Can I, can, is, is that a fair summary statement? That will be it, yes. Fostering competition in lieu of um, policy actions that, that, might have, uh, that might create other distortions. Um, I, I wanna play on that for a minute and, and, and think about that because this role of, of US energy um, in the global energy mix actually is a new one. Um, this, was a, this was a result of um, the very uh, huge gains in supply that we've, that we've experienced in the past few years as we learned how to um, extract resources from our tight rock basins um, and, and um, exceeded expectations in terms of of production and output, but it's a it's a it's an interesting thing to think about, and we have that role to play in the Asia Pacific basin as well. It's a delicate topic, but it's something to think about um, the the geopolitical security advantages that U.S. LNG supply um, and U.S. energy supply uh, offers in that region. I'm curious, uh, Wes and Andrew, whether in the Western states tribal nations organization, whether people realize this and, and the extent to which this might be influencing maybe some of the bigger picture thinking that, that might be going on in state houses and state legislatures and, and as you all interact with energy. Does, is, is this idea something that, um, that people are, are considering? I, I would say uh, that is, that's part of the rationale for us uh, forming our organization um, because you know I, I think uh, a lot of the a lot of the state you mentioned the state houses the public policy officials uh, think of their uh, natural gas supply in terms of just the Peons Basin and and uh, supply to domestic markets and and they don't think of that kind of where the Rockies can fit with our 500 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and, and kind of that global uh, geopolitical puzzle. Uh, and so, you know, we've we've only been in existence uh, for a year, and I would say that at the federal level too. Um, it's it's uh, yeah. I was going to add, it, it, there's there there actually are members of Congress that yes. are starting to realize this. <laughs> right. and, and so the focus really has been on obviously eastern the eastern you know the the uh, Marcellus and and the Permian. You know, we feel we've got a we we should be a part of this story as well. And so that is that is part of our mandate. Uh, is to, and we've, we've been very uh, methodical and, and have our team kind of fanning out. And we've done a number of webinars, uh, both at the, at the state level, uh, but also uh, specifically with the new Biden administration to, to tell our story. Uh, and you know, we've met with uh, the, the incoming uh, officials from the Department of Interior, with uh, the Department of Energy and, and Congress, uh, just, to, just to let them know that you know, we're here uh, we've got a lot of gas, and, and here's where we fit into that overall uh, kind of um, energy geopolitical um, thrust. And it was, you know, maybe uh, highlighted by the, the 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 Trump administration, but we we uh, we feel that we've we've seen some some good language uh, and um, uh, some uh, some accommodating language coming out of uh, uh, Biden uh, the Biden administration, particularly from the Department of Energy as well. So we're we're, we're out there telling that story. Wes, yeah. do you have anything to add? Yeah, I could just add to what Andrew said a little bit. I think that, you know, when we look at uh, emissions and all the sourcing that goes behind that, I think it's not only a state issue or 
a United States issue, it's a global issue. And I think it's about kind of conveying that message and we're just beginning that. I mean, a lot of it has kind of been about domestic policies and what we can do to steer emission reductions. But if the rest of the world's not on board with a plan, then what we do here doesn't necessarily move the needle for the rest of the world. And so the airshed is kind of a joint issue. We all are uh, impacted by that. And I think that it's smart for the federal government and the state governments to actually be in alignment there. And so we've been trying to work on spreading the uh, credible research out there and disseminating that so that people can make informed decisions on policies that steer the net reduction goal for a global agenda. And here in Utah, we know we have other airshed issues going on with the EPA, but maybe they need to stop looking at an airshed issue specifically to Utah and what happens big picture uh, globally. And so that's kind of where Andrew's talking about with the Biden administration and what they're doing on the leasing program uh, for federal land. You know, oil and gas leasing has been put under a moratorium at the same time that we're trying to really promote natural gas production. And there needs to be a good rationale behind these philosophies. Uh, two thirds of Utah is federally uh, owned. So we can't steer away from that subject at all. Um, but I think it is really about kind of rethinking what the actual message is and what it takes to actually lower emissions and, and that fossil fuels actually can be a part of that. So that's kind of where we're at with beginning the message. Yeah, thank you for mentioning it. I mentioned it once and, and, and Wes brought it up and also I'll hammer the point home. You know, we're, we're a part of the solution and as uh, energy geopolitics gets, gets paired with climate change geopolitics, we feel we've, we've got uh, you know, some, some sound technical data to, to guide the administration on their, uh, on their policy making on federal lands to say, we are part of the solution in terms of global greenhouse gas uh, reductions uh, by exporting this gas to higher emitting, to this place, higher emitting fuels. Uh, and so we're, we're hopeful that you know, we're, we're going to release this report uh, um, a week from, a week from uh, today, uh, right after Memorial Day. And we're, we've already, as I stated, we're, we've already been uh, in touch with many of the Biden administration officials, and we hope that they incorporate uh, our technical data into their overall uh, decision making regarding federal lands, oil and gas production. Mm -hmm. I saw Brian nodding um, as you all were making your remarks about rethinking uh, the message. So I wanna give you a, a chance to, to respond to that, but I wanna go back to what you said and hope that you'll respond in that light. You made a very compelling remark, one that I think about a lot. Um, our relative transparency when it comes to what we're trying to do with disclosures uh, on operations and, and reporting and all of that, versus other suppliers. Again, this is a delicate subject. The world is not a level playing field on that front. And, and to the extent that it is a common airshed, um, our, our planetary atmosphere, our envelope, um, it is something to think about. Uh, some of us have spent many long, hard years working with governments of other countries about responsible development of their energy sectors and their resources. It's it's not easy to do. And I think that we have to acknowledge that um, not only can our fossil fuels, because of what we do here to manage them and provide oversight and, and push and nudge to, to always uh, expect um, uh, optimal performance, um, it's going to take some time for all of those non-OECD suppliers, as, as Anna pointed out, to catch up, and that's just a fact. And 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 so, Brian, again, I'm going to kick it over to you to to react to that, and or to the other comments uh, as you see fit. Yeah, so I mean, I, I agree with what all the others others have said, and and I think there is a tendency for for governments, having been somebody who's in government for a long time, to get myopic on the thing that they're focused on, right? And so, it, it is an easy thing for U.S. policymakers to focus on. The greenhouse gas emissions from Project X in the U.S. without looking at what it's doing on the other side of the globe. Candidly, in, in part, we kind of want to take that issue off the table, and that's why we are looking at, again, these additional investments and these new technologies that, that are, are kind of meant to take the, yeah, but we're increasing emissions in the U.S. It's just taken off the table. We, we, we mm -hmm. do think carbon capture can be an important part of this, 
can provide sort of a, a base to, to really help other hard to decarbonize industry um, also store their carbon in places like Southwest Louisiana and Southeast Texas. They have a large concentration of, of hard to decarbonize sectors. And, and, and I think it's, it's the right point that at, at the end of the day, what the thing that we know that countries need to bring people out of poverty to modernize their societies is, as Anna said, affordable, reliable energy. That is the single greatest thing that has, has, has pulled billions of people out of poverty. I, I think it is it is myopic and arrogant of, of some in the U.S. To, to, to want to leave folks where they are and instead find the ways of us providing that secure, lower carbon energy to them, because it is not going to be the case that they simply don't go get that energy. They're going to they're going to get it either from local coal supplies or they are going to get it again from from either regimes that that have have risk around them are not as reliable partners will seek to use that energy access for, for other, other policy goals or, or demands. And exactly that point, I mean, the, some of the estimates of, of pipeline leaks from some of our competitors around the globe dwarf concerns that, that we might have in parts of the upstream in the US. And so that, you know, we can do our part by again, taking as many of those issues off the table as we can. Let's have responsible development. Let's have some responsible regulations around methane leakage and, and venting. Um, let's do what we can on the facilities that exist here in the U.S. or North America. But let's not kid ourselves that if we if we shut all this down here and say the rest of the world can't have it, that the rest of the world is going to is going to is going to leave people in poverty. They're not. They're going to go find the energy sources that are either going to be dirtier or less or less secure. And that that would be a huge miss and a huge missed opportunity for the United States. That's very well said. Um, it's time to close this up, and I want to close it up with with the point that I started at the beginning, and and um, and and these are these are uh, uh, facts and statements that I've made in testimonies. When we look at the target market that was in question today, the Asia Pacific, China in particular, um, China controls roughly eighty percent of battery manufacturing capacity worldwide, and they dominate all of the supply chains associated with that. They control roughly 80%, 70-80% of solar PV manufacturing. Um, that's something that we all now know very well. Uh, roughly 70% of, of wind uh, component manufacturing. Um, wind turbine blades, batteries, almost all parts of, of electric vehicles and so many other items are all derived from materials that are, that, that are derived from hydrocarbon feedstocks. So, there are bigger questions at stake here. Um, there, are the, there is the material side behind all of this, and there is the energy side um, associated in, in bringing materials into the products, uh, the in-use products that we all rely on. So to, to the point of Adebola's work um, and all of this, I think it's worth closing by just thinking about the extent to which we're relying on China and will be relying on China for a very long time to satisfy our demand for alternative energy components, it just seems to me that the least we can do is engage in, in trade, use our comparative advantage in natural gas production and supply to help balance um, some of, of what's going on in our global air shed. So we'll leave you with those thoughts. I wanna thank um, Adebola for the fine work uh, in the report. Looking forward to seeing it published, um, Andrew, and Wes, um, thank you all so much for joining to provide all of the perspectives from uh, the Western States Tribal Nations Group and the, and the affiliate states. Um, it's a wonderful part of, of our country. It's a wonderful part of the world um, and, and worth uh, learning more about for everyone. Um, I wanna thank Brian and Anna for joining in to help flesh out um, some of the viewpoints when the uh, report that has been done by Adebola and his colleagues is, is uh, finished and available, um, the WSTN group will be alerting us. Um, so web links and other things will be available and will help to get that into circulation um, as long, along with everyone else. Thanks everyone today who participated um, and this video will as usual be available on the Baker Institute's YouTube channel um, and hopefully we'll go into circulation. I, I, the viewpoints that you all shared today were excellent. Thanks for the time and thanks for the attention. 
and best of luck as you roll out um, the report and with the WSTN effort.